Hi, I'm Dr. James Thomas. In this series, I'm going over how to visualize nerve function in the larynx. And in this episode, I want to cover the superior laryngeal nerve, how it functions normally, and how to visualize it when it's not functioning. Now, this is the second branch of the vagus nerve. So the upper branch feeds the palate and the pharynx, and this middle branch feeds only a single muscle. It's a sensory nerve, and we can test it that way, but we're gonna focus on visualization of its motor function, which supplies only one muscle, the cricothyroid muscle. So we need to know what the cricothyroid muscle does, and then we need to look at how we can see it when it doesn't function. And we're gonna see it when it's completely non-functional on both sides, and how this is different from when it's non-functional on one side, but still functioning on the other. Let's take a look at a normal functioning larynx and assess the cricothyroid muscle. And we'll do that by changing pitch. On the left side will be the low pitch that we start at. And on the right side, we're going to go through a glide up to a high pitch. And we're gonna see how much the cricothyroid muscle can lengthen the vocal cords. The lengthening that's visible on the right is secondary to cricothyroid muscle contraction. In medicine, there are generally two parts to making a diagnosis, gathering a history and then performing a physical exam. And for the cricothyroid muscle, the most common historical finding is that a surgeon has been in the neck. That's one of the easiest ways and one of the most common ways to injure the cricothyroid nerve. It passes down near the thyroid gland and surgery for an anterior cervical fusion, thyroid gland, carotid artery, all go very near this nerve. And the surgeon doesn't even have to cut the nerve. Just moving the nerve out of the way sometimes devascularizes it and you get a partial injury of conduction of the nerve impulses and you get a, a weakened muscle. So if a surgeon has been in the neck, particularly working on the thyroid gland as it goes very near the superior laryngeal nerve, and if the complaint is a change in the voice, specifically a fuzziness to the voice, a loss of the upper vocal range, particularly singers might notice this, and a loss of volume or ability to get loud, these are all common symptoms of an injury to the superior laryngeal nerve and a cricothyroid muscle that doesn't function as well as it used to. Let's compare this to a case study for a 51-year-old male who had a total thyroidectomy and tells me he completely lost his voice after surgery and it's recovered partially, but his speaking pitch seems lower and he can't get to a high pitch. First, let's take a listen to his speaking pitch. Long ago, men found that it was easier to travel on water than on land. Then, let's listen to his lowest note. E and his highest note. E and when we evaluate this vocal range, we can see it's about half of a typical male vocal range. He has, in fact, lost the upper end. Now let's try the vocal task of gliding up to his highest pitch possible. Let's watch again, slowing the motion down. Okay. And remember that with a wide angle lens of the endoscope, if the larynx gets closer to the camera, there will be apparent enlargement of the larynx overall. In this case, there's no lengthening on either side of the larynx. So it's quite likely that both superior laryngeal nerves were injured during the total thyroidectomy. The superior laryngeal nerve does pass right near the upper end of the thyroid gland on both sides. And even if it's not cut, just removing the blood supply from it to take the gland out can injure one or both sides. Another way to sort out superior laryngeal nerve injury is to combine the history 
along with the visual exam findings and the auditory findings. So in this case, a 62-year-old female who had a right anterior cervical fusion, we know the surgeon was in the neck near the recurrent and superior laryngeal nerves, and she complains that she has lost her upper range, her speaking voice pitch is lower, she's lost volume, and her voice seems fuzzy. And while a recurrent laryngeal nerve injury prevents glottic closure, these are the symptoms when you can't tighten or lengthen the vocal cords and hold them together. Then if we listen to her go up in pitch, she can barely reach G4 in the middle of the C4 octave. <laughs> which for a soprano female is really quite low. Even I as a male can get high, much higher. So we can use ourself as comparison or what we know to be a typical vocal range for a female singer. So by listening to her voice, we know she lacks the upper end. And lastly, when we watch her exam and we watch her attempt to reach her highest pitch, we can see essentially she has only chest register. She can't get up into falsetto and she can't lengthen the vocal cords. She can tension them, that is the thyroid muscle function, but she can't lengthen them, which is the cricothyroid muscle function. Let's take a look at her images and listen to her voice. Again. That's what happens in a bilateral injury when neither side can lengthen the vocal cords. The person attempts to go up in pitch and the vocal cords fail to tighten. Now let's take a look at a unilateral injury. And when that occurs, one side of the larynx contracts, and that has a little effect on the other side, but it's an asymmetric effect. So let's see what happens as a person tries to go up in pitch with one side unable to tighten the cricothyroid muscle up into the high falsetto range. Viewing the vocal cords during stroboscopy at low pitch and high pitch, or on a glide from low pitch to high pitch. And what can be compared here is that at low pitch, only the thyroid muscle is activated for tension. And at high pitch, both the thyroid and the cricothyroid muscle are activated. Consequently, if a person has an injury of the cricothyroid branch of the nerve, then at low pitch, the vocal cords will oscillate symmetrically. And then as you involve Cricothyroid tensioning, it will only occur on one side. That side will remain tense. The vocal cord will oscillate around its axis, while the side that is not tense doesn't have the additional tension supplied by the superior laryngeal nerve to the cricothyroid muscle, will become lax. And it will tend to oscillate lateral to its axis because it lacks sufficient tension compared to the opposite side. So let's look at some examples at low and high pitch. At low pitch, we'll see symmetry and oscillation, both sides of the vocal cord oscillating around their axis. And at high pitch, we'll see asymmetry in tension with the tensor cord oscillating around its axis and the less tense vocal cord oscillating lateral to its axis. <laughs> Let's take a look at a case of a 56-year-old female who presents with two years of progressive loss of her upper vocal range. In addition to losing upper vocal range, she also notes early vocal fatigue that she didn't used to have. She sings in her choir and she's an alto. And now with even 15 minutes of singing, she feels exhausted or tired. We'll begin by testing her vocal capabilities. Long ago, men found that it was easier to travel on water than on land. Listening to her speak, her voice is fairly clear. 
and a steady phonation is also clear. And it's when we begin to go up in pitch where we'll hear a problem. So first, as we go up in pitch, we'll reach a point where she can't go any higher. And for her, that's about C5, which isn't very high for a female. Even an alto really should be able to get higher. I can get higher. And then we'll listen to her singing softly and loudly at the same pitch in her upper range where she's having difficulty. And at low volume, what we'll hear is an onset delay or air leak, a when she reaches her maximum, which suggests that there's a gap between her vocal cords. And when we sing the same tasks at a high volume, now we'll hear roughness, which translates to flutter. One of the vocal cords, in this case, is fluttering when she adds that extra volume to it, so it must lack tension. And we get a double pitch, the good vocal cord that's oscillating at C5, and the other one that is oscillating irregularly at a different pitch. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Put the endoscope in, take a look at her stroboscopy. Vocal cords appear pretty normal. And if you want to identify superior laryngeal nerve pathology, we need to compare this low pitch with a high one. So let's take a look at her highest pitches, the ones she's having trouble with, and the ones where she sounds bad to some degree. On a glide, we could briefly see that something abnormal was going on in the upper end of her range. So let's take a look at pitch E4, and we'll see that the oscillations are fairly symmetric, which suggests that muscle function is even on both sides. And in her case, I believe that's because this is primarily thyroid muscle engagement. The cricothyroid muscle hasn't yet been uh, activated. As we step up to G4, I believe the cricothyroid muscle is starting to kick in. And in this case, I think her right side still has an intact cricothyroid muscle and the left doesn't. So now we have an asymmetric tension between the vocal cords, which manifests itself as a gap between the vocal cords and air leak. And if we look at this closely at low airflow, the vocal cord that has more tension, the vocal cord is oscillating around both sides of its axis. And the vocal cord with less tension is oscillating lateral to its axis and through a small range because there's not enough airflow to entrain the vocal cord. Now, if we increase the subglottic pressure at the same pitch, we have enough airflow enough pressure to entrain the vocal cord that's looser. But because we have two separate tensions, they'll tend to vibrate at separate pitches and our ear perceives diplophonia as roughness in her voice. <coughs> then, as we go up to her highest pitch at low subglottic pressure, we hear air leak because the cords don't close. The tighter cord oscillates, generating sound, and the looser vocal cord is not moving enough to emanate sound energy from it. So all we hear is the white noise of the air leak and the single pitch. And it, this is why it takes her a lot of effort to sing because she's having to use much more air to get the same sound that she would have in the past had the vocal cords come completely together. So our visual exam explains her symptoms. One of the caveats of making a diagnosis of superior laryngeal nerve paresis is that there are conditions that can mimic it. 
Uh, for instance, I've seen an individual that had a cricothyroidotomy, and that ended up fixing the cricothyroid joint in place. So even though the muscles and the nerve were functioning, it couldn't move. For example, let's take this case of a 56-year-old male who's a classically trained singer, and he said about two years ago, he noticed he couldn't get into falsetto anymore. So let's take a listen to his vocal capabilities. Long ago, men found that it was easier to travel on water than on land. So he's missing the upper octave of what a typical male vocal range would be. And given that he's a classically trained singer, you can hear how tight his voice is even in the middle of his range. And let's look at his examination. We notice that he has no falsetto and that as he tries to stretch the vocal cords, he reaches his maximum pitch but can't go any higher and they don't lengthen. This is a good time when we don't have a history that's conducive to a nerve injury to take a look at a CT scan of the larynx and specifically the cricothyroid joint. On his CT scan, there was apparent fixation of his right cricothyroid joint and after I reviewed this with him, he also noted that he was beginning to develop symptoms of arthritis in his hands and feet. So I think the most likely explanation is the right joint is fixed from arthritis. In summary, a uh, history of surgery in the neck, especially in this mid portion near the superior laryngeal nerve, a description of loss of upper range or loss of power or both, lead the examiner to think about a superior nerve injury. It's important to listen to the voice at both low and high pitch because the cricothyroid muscle that's innervated by the superior laryngeal nerve takes the voice up into that high range. And then listening to the high range at low volume and high volume can elicit findings that orient the examiner to a superior laryngeal nerve injury. And lastly, when looking at the voice, it's absolutely essential to look at the vocal cords at high pitch because that's where the impairment is going to be present. Thanks for listening to an explanation of how to identify superior laryngeal nerve injuries in the larynx. I'm Dr. James Thomas.